Hello everyone and welcome back to Asian Nagash which is a channel dedicated to Age of Sigma and in this video we are going to be talking all about Age of Sigma terminology. So this video is definitely aimed at beginners and that's why this video is going to be part of my How to Play series but what we're going to be doing in this video is talking about buzzwords in the community or shortened words or abbreviations and to try and help you understand what they mean. And that means that when you're in conversation with other people talking about Warhammer, especially if you're brand new, you're gonna understand what they're talking about rather than just pretending and nodding your head. Again, that this list is just gonna be 21 uh, like words, you know, abbreviations, like I said, all those sorts of things. I'm just gonna have 21 examples here. You could have many more examples. And what I'd be interested in is let me know your examples down below if I haven't covered them in this video, so that anyone who's watching this video and trying to learn up how to play Age Sigma, but just like understand the community and everything else, um, they will benefit from your experience and everything in the comments as well. And this video is gonna be pretty damn basic. I mean, we'll start with really, really simple terms. People are brand new to Warhammer, really simple terms. And then when we get to the end, it will be a bit more in depth, complicated terms, but still like all within a friendly beginner environment. So if you are new to Warhammer Age of Sigma, or I suppose Warhammer in general, this video will be useful to you. And if you've got any other further questions, put them in the comments down below and I will happily answer them best I can. And if you do enjoy the video, make sure to smash that like button. So the first example that I want to talk about is going to be what does GW stand for? And what does GW stand for? It means Games Workshop. Now, if you're watching this and you're in the Warhammer community, you're probably going to think that's an incredible simple um, example to use. But people who are brand new to this hobby, it just... GW is one of those common words that we use when we talk about uh, Warhammer and the company itself. And if you don't know what GW means, then all that's just going to go over your head. And as we treat it as a very simple thing, it's important to know what it means. So GW just means Games Workshop. And something important to note is that all the Warhammer stores, they used to be called Games Workshops. And now they're all turning into Warhammer stores. And they've, either, they've either done it already or they're still in the process of doing it. So... Someone might say, you know, um, have a game at the local uh, GW or something like that. And what that actually means is like the local Warhammer store. So then the next one, which is what does AOS mean? So this is very important because if you don't know what this means, it's about time you do. So AOS means Age of Sigma. Now that's really quite straightforward. It's just abbreviated. So when, for example, um, I'm talking about Age of Sigma in like group chats and stuff, I'm not having to type the whole Age of Sigma all the time. I just do that for my YouTube video. So you can just type AOS. And then the next one is what does 40K mean? And 40K means Warhammer 40,000. Again, if you're, like I said, already in the Warhammer hobby and you probably know all these, so these are the, <coughs> pardon me, these are like the three easiest examples um, I can give, but they're also very important to know. And you might be thinking like, if it's Age of Sigma, why is 40K important? Um, there's a lot of cross references between uh, either or, and it's always important to know what the other game is about. Like, I don't fully understand how it works, 40k, but it's good to have an importance there. And also, the law is very cool. And then going on to the next thing so, what does law slash fluff mean? And that means your story and narrative. So, you'll see that in all my videos where I talk about story. Um, and the narrative for um, certain armies, everything else. I don't say like fleshy a court story or fleshy a court narrative. I will say law because law is just like the fundamental of what um, is like canon in the terms of story within these fantasy worlds. You know, it's in everything, you know, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, um, you know, Warhammer as well, of course. And that's why a lot of the times when I won't even say like, story and narrative it's just so used to me to say law and also i don't know if it's a local thing like in the uk or whatever but it might be everywhere anyway um fluff is definitely a other word that means that and if you're like say brand new um you might not know what they mean and it's quite important to to know it i mean like when i say it's quite important i mean you don't need to know all this stuff but it's just useful to know when you're engaging in conversation essentially and then the next one is what does d6 mean so a D6 means a six-sided die, and die is obviously just a single dice. And the reason I put this up is because when I was younger and I tried to understand why I'm a fantasy, we're talking about, I was probably about nine years old, something like that, um, and I had like the army book, uh, Orcs and Goblins, it was at the time, I think, and it said, um, roll a D6. I didn't have a clue what a D6 was, like, and I didn't even know what it was until I got back into Warhammer when I was about 20. 
So it's not even like, oh, I, I learned out through life what D6 meant. I had no idea. Um, but now that I know a simple S is just a six-sided dice, so if you do, you know, D&D &D and stuff, you have D20s and everything like that. So whatever the D and then the number is, it's just how many sides that die or dice have. And then what does D3 mean? Now, a D3 means a three-sided dice. Now, the interesting thing about this is this comes up a lot in Age of Sigma. You'll find your um, War Scrolls and your, like, damage characteristic for, a, let's say, a sword is D3 damage. If you're very new to the game, it's one of the first sort of questions you ask is, um, how do I roll a D3? Because there aren't three-sided dice. Again, if there is an example of a three-sided dice out there, put it in the comments down below. But, you know, generically, there's not many 3D dice about. So what you do is, oh, sorry, not 3D, obviously, they're all 3D, but uh, D3. Um, but what you do is essentially you just roll a D6, so just your normal dice that you can see on the screen now, and um, you roll that, and then you just half the result. And... Um, and what that means is so easy, you rolled a six, halve it, now that's a three. And let's say you rolled, I don't know, a little bit more interesting, you rolled a three. So if you halve a three, that's 1.5, um, right? So what does that mean? You round it up to make it a two. So it's really as straightforward as that. Um, but it's like definitely one from my own personal experience that seems really simple and easy if you're in the hobby. But if you're not, um, maybe you're like me, you didn't understand. And then the next one is uh, this is talking more sort of in depth with Age of Sigma now rather than just as a whole. And that's going to be army slash faction. So that means allegiance. And what is like, what I mean by army slash faction, I mean, let's say you go, um, I play Beasts of Chaos, right? Let's just say that you play Beasts of Chaos. Um, so that's your army. Technically, it's actually your allegiance. And that's why there's a big like difference in sometimes in how you play the game. Um, and remember that they don't call like Cowden and Overlords. It's not uh, what army do you play? Uh, not Cowden and Overlords. Technically, what it's meant to be is like what allegiance do you play? You know, what allegiance are you playing in this battle? Let's say you go to a tournament, your allegiance is, let's say, soon to be Soul Blight Grave Lords, right? Um, rather than that's your army. It's commonly just said as your army because obviously that comes off the tongue a lot easier than allegiance but also you know someone goes like um oh do you play order yeah what faction do you play i play daughters of cain again like daughters of cain allegiance something else that's um worthy to note is that when you have your battle tomes and you read uh, the front of a battle tome like shall i quickly get one up now to just do a quick example uh yeah why not this wasn't planned but anyway um so if you can see on here again i think my screen's quite tiny on this one but anyway it's the blades of corn um battle tome so does that mean that your army is blades of corn and your allegiance is blades of corn? No, your allegiance is actually just corn. You can ignore the first two bits. So that's why it's sometimes important to definitely take note. It's the same with, I think mainly the Chaos Gods are probably the biggest examples where you have uh, Man King of Nurgle, which is Nurgle Allegiance. Uh, he knights of Sinesh, you can see on the screen now, is just Sinesh. And then Disciples of Zeech is just Zeech. Um, but yeah, again, all that subject to change. But I think it's always something important to note um, as allegiance is the key. I have actually done a video on how allegiances and sub-allegiances work as part of my How to Play Age of Sigma series. So you can go check that out if you'd like more information. But I thought it's just something worthy to note here. And again, like I said, I've got 21 examples and I'm going through them quite quickly. This video isn't designed to be long because, um, because it's aimed at beginners and stuff. I might be wrong, but... Um, Compared to my usual videos, they go on quite a long time, especially like the in-depth ones. I think if you're quite new to the uh, game and the hobby and the community as a whole, you probably don't want the videos to be too long. You just want to like learn the information without having to watch over an hour or whatever. So uh, the next one is um, Army Abbreviation. So I've just put a few examples up here, but I think this is definitely something if you're um, very new to the game. Like if I was to uh, look at 40k, I would have the same problem probably. Or if I was to look at... I don't know, Horus Heresy or Lord of the Rings or whatever. Because what you've got is army abbreviation. So the three that, oh, the four I've put up, i put one for each Grand Line. So we've got Doc, which means Daughters of Cain. You've got FEC, which means Flesh Eater Courts. And you've got BOC, which means a Beast of Chaos. And then you've got Sob, which means Sons of Behemoth. So the reason why it's important to know this is frequently if you go onto Facebook and you're in the Warhammer Age of Sigma, uh, big group on there or you're um, texting in a local group or something like that and someone will go like I don't know does anyone want a game they want to test out their doc now you might be wondering what what is doc you know again if you're not brand new to the game you're not going to piece together oh obviously that's what that you know a whole army title stands for um 
And it's just an example because, like, again, it's the same with AOS. Um, why you say that rather than type in or say in Age of Sigmas, it's just quicker. And obviously, that's the point of abbreviations. That's not the point of this video to um, get down to the bottom of basically what's the point of abbreviations. But um, they certainly are used a lot in Age of Sigma, and there are more examples than just this. But abbreviations for armies are common examples of when they are used. But the next one as well is going to be uh, meta. So what does this mean? So it means the common armies, uh, tactics and units used. So say common armies it should be common allegiances. Um, however, there's not much space to write in these boxes that I've designed. So this means either you can have like a local meta. So that's like what everyone plays in your local store. So let's say, for example, in my local store, I play against uh, mainly three good buddies of mine. Um, and if I'm going like pre-COVID when we played quite a bit, what sort of arms they had? We had a guy who played um, Deepkin and Slays of Darkness and Corn, who's um, Jamie, who's been on that long in-depth Slays of Darkness uh, series we did. I went against um, Wayne who had like things like Ogre Moor Tribes or Gloom Spike Gits, um, or like I think he had Fire Slayers as well in Skaven. And then I had uh, played against a guy called Neil, who had uh, like Stormcast, Sylvaneth, and Caradon, Overlords, and Fire Slayers. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean like they're the three people I always play in my local meta. So uh, those are going to be the three armies I always fight until they start a new army. So that is the local meta. So then that means that my army, so my allegiance I take, and my tactics and units are all going to be suited to try and best one of those armies that they could bring. So then that is what creates the meta, as that is what I know I'm going to fight against. So there's no point prepping to fight against, um, I don't know, the Zypsers each of no one in my local area has got it. So when you go to talking about like a more global sort of meta, it's like a tournament meta as it's commonly known, that is when things get a lot bigger, because obviously you could go against any army and what that means is that because like most armies are taken to tournaments you then get to that point where you may have heard before I've said on this channel you know where you have like the top five armies so the top five armies that consistently do well at tournaments and they they change all the time they've been a bit stagnant for a while now but they tend to change all the time and um, what that means is you're going to know that those five top armies they may be the five most common armies taken to a tournament, not always, but it could mean. So that means that you have to think, how am I gonna do if I go against that army? Am I gonna be prepped to try and deal with their shenanigans? If you've got, you know, if that army is way up there and your army is down here, you know, you're thinking, I'm gonna come across that army half of the tournament and then it's gonna kick me down. And you might just accept that because you might go, right, okay, I'm not gonna be um, prepped to deal with, um, for example, let's just say Luminous Realm Lords, but I am gonna be prepped to deal with other armies who are about the same tier as I am. And then that's when, like, the, um, you know, the uh, tournament sort of meta comes into it. Again, you could talk about this for ages. Um, there's so much you could say um, about the meta, but really this is just explaining what the meta means. Again, when I got into Age of Sigma, I had no idea what meta meant, so uh, that's why I thought it would be a useful one. And then the next one is MSU. So that means multiple small units. And there's a re uh, reason why there's a eels on the screen now because um for example if you're an idnf deepkin player you played against um idnf deepkin so you know the cls one of the common things they do is they take a lot of eels but they also take small units of eels because eels are very fast they can do quite a good damage output even if it's just three of them they can certainly do a good job and they can get to where they need to be so msu is a tactic where instead of taking you know big blocks of i don't know 40 infantry or like eels for example where you can take units of nine the person may take um, a unit of six and a unit of three or maybe three units of uh, threes an army that i went against uh, recently was a winter by um, ogre Moor tribe army that had loads of yetis in it he had 21 yetis and that was seven units of three and why was that so good because they had lots of shenanigans and he played it very well but um target priority so for example he had all those units and he had more things in his army as well but it was hard to equally like target 21 units and no sorry not 21 units it was hard to target seven units um rather than if he just had like two big blocks of yetis as an example then it would just go right focus on that one then focus on the other one 
And because um, his Yeti's like, he could do a prayer to return one to a unit a turn, it meant it quite hard to try and sprinkle damage and everything. So um, it certainly does have its use. I'd say MSU is probably um, got a higher skill cap to it. Like it's, um, it's probably easier to just have a big unit of pain that would do a lot of damage to the enemy and to get used to controlling that big unit and do what it needs to do rather than having all these separate cogs in the machine, rather than just having like, basically having three big cogs in your army that do everything. And now you have 14 little cogs and you have to keep all of them turned and stuff. So it um, could be a higher skill cap, but it certainly is very rewarding if you get it right. Um, and that's basically what MSU uh, means. So the next thing is elite army. So on the other side of MSU, you then have elite army. So basically um, an army of small model counts. That could be anything from like we've got on the screen, like a, a boulder head, like Beast Claw uh, Raider army from the Ogre Moor tribes. Or it could be something like a Flashy Court army from uh, Gristle Gore with loads of terror geists. Or it could even be something like, um, uh, let's say a, an army that I've done, like say Flashy Courts again, but I've taken loads of flares. So I've taken like 27 flares, which again is more than like five monsters or something. So in comparison, it's a, almost a horde army. But what it means is like, well, I've got like uh, in the 27 flare list, I've probably had about like 32 models or something. So where I had 32 models, I might go against someone who's got 140 models in their army. So that's where like you get that elite aspect. I personally much prefer elite armies because essentially they're just funner to play because those hordes are they're great. I think horde armies look fantastic. And I know you've got movement trays and I've got movement trays now, so it's a lot easier. But if you haven't got movement trays, God forbid, you know, have to move like 140 as an example, models across the battlefield or something. I'd rather just push my big monsters around. And that's why, you know, like Son of Behemoth is a very uh, popular army or the Gristle Gore army was with the Terror Geist and stuff um, because it is just fun playing with a small elite model count. But then going on to the next thing, so, um, so CP. So what does this mean? It means a command point. So this is like very much, um, not talking about the, the whole of Age of Sigma, but it's this sort of in-game, um, a CP is something that we use to use command abilities currently in Age of Sigma. Happens to have been a Warhammer um, Age of Sigma third edition announcement yesterday. And on that, they said, like, there's going to be more things you can do for command points in third edition. So there's going to be more things. But at the moment, um, use for command abilities and stuff. And CPs are a very high valued uh, resource. And again, short on CPs, it's just easier than typing the whole thing out. But yeah, so that's that. And flush it, of course, on the screen because they absolutely love command points. And then the next one we have got is talking about deep striking. So this means a unit that is set up off the board and can deploy during the game. So you might find you go against your opponent and they've got, um, let's say they're a, I'm trying to remember the rules completely, but let's say they are a Nighthorn army. And in the Nighthorn army, they can deploy units in the underworld, I believe it's called. So that means for every unit they've got set up on the board, they can deploy another unit in the underworld. I think it's a one for one ratio on that. Um, what that means is, so the game starts, you look at their army and you might go, there's only like a thousand points on the table versus my 2000 points. And, um, but they've got, like I said, like another thousand points in the underworld, which probably means they have to come up before turn four, but they tend to come up at the like end of their movement phase or something like that. So what that means is very important. And deep striking is always a question you should ask your opponent. Have you got any deep striking? or summoning or teleporting, because then that means if they say they haven't got any deep striking or they can't teleport or summon, you don't have to worry about your backboard so much because you can just push forward depending on your army and the enemy can't just quickly teleport behind you or deep strike behind you. Um, and if they can deep strike or teleport and summon, that means you have to start like protecting your backboard. So you don't want your opponent to uh, be able to really badly outflank you or like take your back objectives. So you have to either um, keep you know certain units depending on what you've got in your army at the back or you can have um, like use more screens to try and stop the enemy from getting to behind you and uh, deep striking is a important one deep striking summoning and uh, teleporting are three very different things but they all come to the same point of can you basically um, take advantage of like uh, basically um, 
empty board space and outflank me. So deep striking is always an important one to remember. And then uh, screening and chaff. So we talked about um, screening and chaff. So what does it mean? So it means generally a weak uh, units to uh, be used to keep important units alive. So what I meant when I ripped that is basically, let's say I've got uh, a unit of six more gas harbingers in my army. Again, a very point heavy invested unit. It's probably something I haven't run for a while, but a unit of six more gas harbingers in my army. What I did when I took it to Warhammer World Tournaments is I also took um, one uh, or oh, I took multiple units of direwolves, uh, which were from Legions of the Gash, and I'd take a unit of ten, and if I put a unit of ten direwolves in front of my Morgost um, harbingers, it meant that they could screen, so that in turn means that the enemy, unless they can fly, can't charge my Morgus Harbingers, so they charge the screen, they kill the screen, or they do some damage to it, and then I counter charge with the Morgus Harbingers. So basically, the enemy wants to get to you, and they don't have flying or any shenanigans like that, they're going to have to do a trade. So they're going to have to trade their good unit to kill your Direwolves in this scenario, to be able to get to your Morgus Harbingers, but at that point, your Morgus Harbingers are just going to counter charge. And you can also use screens, so like I say, screen the back of the board. So when I play Slaves of Darkness, I even um, like allied in a couple of units of uh, Chaos Warhounds. Really, really cheap units. They'll die to anything. But you can have a unit of 10 of them for, for I can't remember the points now. I think maybe 80 points, something like that. And uh, very cheap anyway. And you have a unit of 10 of them. And what they would do is they'll just string out at the back of the board. And because you have... Um, 10 of them, they're all like the standard sort of like small cavalry bases. That meant that, you know, 10 of them could basically screen the whole backboard, pretty much. If you wanted to do a bit more, you could have something else screen, but you could screen basically the whole rear of your army with um, a unit of 10 uh, Chaos Warhounds in that case. And essentially a screen chaff, and it's always what I talk about. So, for example, if your enemy wants to alpha charge you, so that means charge you in their first turn before you have a turn because they outdropped you. And what outdropped means they outdeployed you so they can choose who goes first, currently in Age Sigma. And now before you know it, before you've even done anything, the enemy's charging you with like a lot of pain, right? So what you can do when you set up is make sure that you have your cheap units you don't care about, like I said, Direwolves in my case, or Chaos Warhounds. Um, you can set up so if the enemy wants to charge you unless they have any shenanigans, um, they're gonna have to charge the screens. And even if you go, well, they can fly, so they can charge over, or double the screens up or whatever, if you can. Um, so that's why screening and chaff, as it's commonly known, is something that I always look for, generally when I build my army lists, like um, I did when I played about Skaven and stuff. I had uh, two units of 40 clan rats, and their only job was to protect everything else that was important. And I was charged by, I think it was 24 piggies? Like, so when I say piggies... Um, Iron Jaw uh, Gore Grunters. And those Iron Jaw Gore Grunters did a hell of a lot of pain to my clan rats. I think they killed all 80 of them. But then I just got to charge back, shoot, and with everything else that was important and was still alive because of those clan rats and managed to melt all those piggies away within a turn or two. And if I didn't have the screen and the chaff, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So that's why it's really useful. And then the next one we've got is target saturation. So which means having a lot of important models in your army so the enemy cannot take them all out. So I'm just going to get a quick drink. So what this basically means is, let's say you have an army where you go, how does your army work? You know, like, for example, that's a common question your opponent will ask you at a tournament. Um, you know, what, what makes your army tick? How, how is it so good? What characters are really important to your army? What heroes are the cogs of your army that make everything go so well? And um, if you go, oh, it's just what this one guy here. And it's like, oh, really? Yeah, it's like, how many wins does he have? I don't know. It's, you know, they just say six. What's his save? A four up? And it's like, and the enemy's like, oh, okay. He's going to die straight away, and then the rest of the army will fall apart. But if you've got, so an example I can think of is... Um, Seraphon. So Seraphon have lots of moving parts within them, like I can't remember all the names of the things, but obviously you've got a Lord Croak and you've got a like standard bearer, like Astroff standard bearer thing is called. Um, and then you've got a, a skink chief, a skink priest, whatever order it goes in. But you've got lots of things that make that army so good. So you can't just go, right, I take out one of the skink heroes and then that solves the problem. 
and you can't just go, oh, I'm going to get rid of Croak easy because he's hard to kill. So if you have lots of things in your army that are the reason why the synergy of your army is so good, rather than just one thing, like even if you just go, um, let's say you've got, I'm trying to think of like one good thing. Let's say you've got Nagash. And again, he is, okay, not Nagash, he's, he's too big. Uh, let's say you've got Arkan the Black, and you go, right, right, an Anobi army, Arkan the Black's like, yeah, he's my only caster, he does this, he does this, he's really useful for this reason, he's healing everything, the enemy's just going to shoot him, <laughs> right, and get rid of him. But if you go, well, I've got Arkan the Black, I've got two Leech Kavioses, who will give me extra um, attacks, I then also have a Mortal and Soul Mason, who's giving me reroll ones to hit, I then have a Bone Shaper, who's also doing some healing. Again, this is stacking a lot of points in OBR. But you can see the point where the enemy can't just take out like the one thing that's making everything work so well. Um, so then that's why it's useful to have all these things rather than just, um, like I said, just one thing. And that's something you'll find where you probably go against a lot of enemy shooting. Like we've got KO on the screen, haven't we? And that's because um, enemy shooting is... Um, I mean, I've been torn around a bit with um, OBR and catapults lately, but before that, I never really did much shooting. And um, I can tell you from now trying shooting out, it's very easy to just pick things in the enemy army and they die. Um, so, yeah, that, that's pretty much all there is for uh, for target saturation. Again, if any of the examples and stuff I'm given, anything you think you would add more on, um, put that in the comments down below. But it's very useful rather than just having one good thing and if the enemy kills it, your army falls apart. And then the next thing is, um, so hammer. So this is like hammer unit. So it's quite self-explanatory. It just means it's an aggressive unit. Um, so basic, it could be things like a glass cannon. Again, that's another that's another saying. So it could be like a glass cannon. So what does that mean? It goes in, it hits really hard. It can wipe most things out, but it has to attack first. So if the enemy attack it first, it's probably gonna die pretty quickly. If I can think of an example that I've used, something like Chaos Chosen, where they can do a lot of pain to the enemy, especially if they're heavily buffed. Um, but if something goes wrong, they've only got a four up save, and particularly against enemy shooting, if enemy shooting gets to them before they do any damage, they will die really quickly. And now you're missing your hammer for your army. So that's why it's also useful to have more than one hammer unit in your army. So if it dies, you're not completely reliant on the, the dead unit now you're putting back into your carry case to uh, try and carry you across the table. You've got um, other units and stuff as well. So yeah, pretty self-explanatory. And then an anvil, so this is just the other side of you know hammer and anvil, isn't it? So it means a defensive unit. So you can see like a Chaos Warrior on the screen now. So you can have um, a unit of Chaos Warriors, I don't know, a unit of 20 Chaos Warriors with a free up save, um, re-roll and all failed save rolls, a five up mortal wound save, and like minus one to hit. You could like stack it like that, or you could do it with, like, I know Slaves of Darkness Iron Golems is a is a good example as well, especially in Nurgle and like Idolators and stuff, and there are many other examples out there that are units that are very, very hard to kill, like Ishling Guard, for example, where unless the enemy's got mortal wounds, they just sit there. Well, they don't sit, they fly around the table because obviously they have great movement. But when they do get into fighting, if they make a charge as well, they can end up... I've had it as well where like they have like a two-up save uh, and they don't take any rend and they all use all-out defense to reroll ones to um, save. So there are some anvil units out there. So they might not be the best at dealing damage. Michelin guards too aren't bad. Uh, but, you know other examples and stuff out there but they are going to be your defensive units so you may be the unit you plop on an objective you know phoenix guard is a other great one i can't not say so um yeah so these units can be very very useful as well uh mortate guard etc and then the next one we've got is a death star so it means a one unit killing machine yeah You've got things like um, the gash going around, Span and Marcane Bolt. You've got other things, like I said, like a unit of six Morgus Harbingers. Um, you've got lots of things where you could do a massive points invest into this one thing to go around killing everything. But what you'll find is you'll go to your game and it'll go well. And not one thing will kill everything, but then you'll play your next game and you're bound to go against Bellacor, annoyingly. Um, and he will make your one thing for a turn or two turns, not be able to do anything unless they roll a five up to do so. And that's um, that's just one example out there. And there's other examples. What I'm trying to say is if you invest all your points into one thing to do all the work in your army, 
your opponent could just debuff that thing by stacking minuses to hit on it or minus to attack or making it only be able to charge a 1d6 and not be able to run and all these other things to now mean everything that you're uh, relying on in your army, that one unit is now too debuffed to do anything. And then that's when you're in a big trouble. So Death Stars are very useful. Um, I think they were more important in um, Age of Sigma uh, probably a couple of years back. Um, now it's became clear that you need to have, instead of just one big massive killing machine, you need to have multiple threats in your army. So you need at least like three threats, I'd say, in your army, um, rather than just one big thing. But I will say things like, um, you know, uh, Lord Croak, he is a one unit killer machine, pretty much, and uh, he does rather well, but then he has other things in the army to support, like skinks and salamanders and stuff. And then going on to the next one, we have CUM. So this is come. So this means competitive unit manipulation. And what that means is now we've been talking about all these uh, very strong strategies we have in all these different units in Age of Sigma. Obviously, you're not the only one who knows that. Your opponent knows that as well. And it's all about trying to trick your opponent's strong units into doing things they don't really want to do. Like, for example, if your opponent has a very good, strong tactical unit and it's on the... Um, Let's say it's sort of like mid to left of their territory. And then you just send like one small flanking unit right on the side of the board. The enemy doesn't want to have to deal with that one small flanking unit. But it, now it's going to have to. Obviously that one small flanking unit is going to go around and take a back objective for example. So now they have to commit more than it's worth to deal with your one small flanking unit with that one big tactical unit they had. So that is an important one to know. And then the next one is going to be house rules. So what does house rules mean? So it means tweaking the rules of the game to make it more enjoyable. So this isn't just for Age of Sigma. This is for everything, obviously, which basically means, um, let's say there's a rule in Age of Sigma where a, a, a common thing is maybe you guys don't like the double turn um, process. You know where you roll for priority in Age of Sigma. Let's say you came from Warhammer 40k to Warhammer Age of Sigma. Now, I personally like the double turn, but, you know, conversation for another time um, but what this means is you can have something like you play at home just with your buddy and if you both agree you just go like whoever goes first is always going to go first and then it's you go I go you go I go sort of situation or there's things like um I just go I think that rule's stupid let's change that just little things like that because at the end of the, uh, the day you're going to be playing this game for your enjoyment and your opponent enjoyment, so yours and your buddy's enjoyment. And if there's anything you think you could tweak in the rules to make it more enjoyable, you can do it. You can even go things like as far to go, you know what, I think the Hydra is really, really cool, you know, the War Hydra in Age of Sigma. It's an absolutely awesome model. It has absolutely terrible rules. Why don't we make its weapons an extra damage or something? You know, just something fun. And again, it sort of probably drifts more into like the narrative sort of side, but you can do house rules to really try and influence the narrative in the games that you're going to play and like i said you know it's one of those things where if you're planning to go to tournaments don't get used to doing house rules at the time but especially if you're new to the game go i don't fully understand how rend works yet again rend is something that's like quite easy to understand once you know what it is and i've done videos trying to explain you know and on the table of how to play age sigma etc um but let's just say for whatever reason you know i don't really understand the rend rule um, can we just not do that? I go, yeah, obviously, you know, while you're learning the game, well, let's just say, you know what, I'm absolutely fed up of shooting armies. Can we just agree not to play any shooting for like the next two weeks or something? You know, all these little house rules, right? And then the next one is uh, WYSIWYG, which means what you see is what you get. So I don't think I knew what this meant until like the second tournament I went to or something. And uh, because like it's, you know, a made up uh, abbreviation and everything else. And uh, what it basically means is what you see is what you get. That means that, let's say uh, you go to a tournament and on the tournament pack, so on the rules pack that's come for the tournament, so you know how to uh, attend the tournament, how to um, make your army for the tournament, everything else, may say um, it is WYSIWYG, which means that, let's say you bring, uh, what's a good example? Uh, well, straight away went to Skeleton Warriors, but they may be uh, changing, obviously, with the new... Um, Sell like great pods, but screw it. Let's go skeleton warriors. So let's say you equipped all your skeleton warriors with spears, and so you got I don't know two blocks of forty skeleton warriors with spears, and then you go to the tournament, and then 
you've written on your list though that it's two blocks of 40 skeletons with swords and uh you go to your tournament play the first game got your guys up with spears and your opponent goes oh you said it's swords on your list and you go oh yeah i'm just gonna say they've got swords you can't do that because it says it's WYSIWYG. Again, you might like it, you might not like it. It's down to the tournament's discretion and everything else or how you want to play. But it also comes into really like using proxies. So let's say um, I, I want to use a corpse cart on my army, but I don't have one, but I've got a Chaos Chariot and I believe it's on the same size base. Bear with me, guys, if that's true or not. Um, it's like, do you mind if I just use the Chaos Chariot as the, the corpse cart? Um, and you might go, yeah, yeah, you know, that's fine. Good problem. And then it might be like, the 15th game in, I'll go like, oh, do you mind if you used the chariot and corpse? No, buy the fucking corpse cart by now. Um, so, you know, take it or leave it pretty much. But um, And that's uh, going to be my 21 examples of uh, terminology for Age of Sigma. So like it's already said, so leave your examples of AOS terminology in the comments down below because there are many more out there. And it was quite, um, it wasn't like too strenuous coming up with this list because a lot of these things are examples that I thought of, that I didn't know. Um, what I got into Age of Sigma. Something I've learned from doing YouTube is there's so many people get into Age of Sigma all the time. I know a lot of people who are new to Warhammer watch my channel. So that's why I thought it's always important. I always like to um, do videos aimed towards uh, beginners um, into Age of Sigma. And like I said, at the start of the video, I purposely say, do not watch this video if you are an experienced Age of Sigma player because you'll know what pretty much all this stuff is. But if you are new, some of this stuff you might not have known. And even if it was, I don't know, five out of the 21 examples you didn't know and now you know now, then it's going to help you when you especially get back into the Warhammer community because you might have got into Warhammer, which I know some of you have because I've spoken to some of you, um, just before COVID and now COVID's happened. And now that means that you sort of were learning it and then you haven't played it for over a year. So now you're a bit like, oh, I sort of like, I want to get back into it and I'm determined to, but I feel a little bit off track of, you know, the lingo and everything else. Um, hopefully this is try to help you get back on track for when you get back into like your local game store and everything else. And like I said, leave all your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you've got any other questions or anything like that, ask me as well in the comments and I'll be happy to try and help you as best I can. Um, obviously, because I want to try and get as many people into this great hobby as I always do say. I'm just going to get another drink of water. Again, this is all being recorded in one go because I, I thought it's quite nice. I got myself in the top corner and stuff to try and explain it to you rather than just being pre-recorded. I mean, this is pre-recorded by the time you watch it, but that's not important. So the next thing I want to say is just as simple as if you did enjoy this video, guys, could you please smash the like button, the subscribe button and the bell notification? I know I always say for you guys to do this, but it, it really does help by liking the video. It shows to me that you guys enjoy this sort of content. So maybe if we get enough likes in this video, I will do an other video like this talking about more terminology for Age of Sigma. So if you want to see that, make sure you smash the like button. And it also helps YouTube to know that people enjoy the video. So hopefully it will make it easier for other people to find the video and um, obviously learn from it as well. And by subscribing to the channel, that is how at the end of the day, this channel grows. Um, of course, you know, the bigger the channel gets, you know, obviously the more important and better things I can make for the channel. And by pressing the bell notification, it means that you'll never miss one of my future videos. So if you're enjoying any of the series I've got at the moment or things like this of how to play Age of Sigma, click the um, bell notification and it'll mean that you'll never miss any of them. And what I also want to say as well is if you would like to support the channel a step further, I have actually got a Patreon and YouTube membership, which means that if you click the join button, next to the subscribe button and allow you to become an Agent of Gash member, which means that you can do anything from donate one pound to the channel and that money goes straight towards keeping me going, doing what I'm doing and keep making this content for people. Or there's a link to my Patreon down below. If you go to my Patreon, you can give anything from just one dollar a month. And again, same thing, it goes straight towards keeping myself and the channel going. And I want to do a massive shout out to the people who have decided to do this because not gonna lie, like I always say, it um, wasn't for the Patreon money and uh, YouTube uh, membership and YouTube, or well, to be fair, all those three things, they don't like generate enough money for me to uh, be able to say that this is profitable. You know, I spend more money and more resources and time on this than any money I get out of it. But these people showed to me that this is worth doing. And because of that, I really can't thank them enough. So if you'd like to become one of these amazing people, click the join button or click the link to my Patreon down below. So the two biggest supporters that I wanna say first are gonna be my Vampire Lords on Zombie Dragon. So this is gonna to be to Stuart F and Philco, who because of them, 
I am able to, like I say, always keep this up and always try and get um, videos out to you guys, try and help you guys get into Age of Sigma and continue Age of Sigma journey. And these two in particular people are the biggest supporters and they give a huge amount to the channel. So a huge thank you to you guys. Please keep up the good work. And then my Morgas, who is Bleed Red, who has been a Morgas for a long time now. So thank you for your continued support. And then my vampires, who are going to be Mir, Martin S, Raus321, David A, Ronnie H, Sparebear, Christopher H, Northdrop, Nathan F, and Stents. Thank you all so much for supporting us. Vampires is very generous of you as well at that tier. And I know a lot of you have been doing it for a long time now. And then my Necromancers, which is Jack Hell, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sagas, Wolf Nick, Michael W, Quad, Cranky Wombat, Christopher C, Krista F, James S, Robin S, Steve T, James T, Patrick F, JJ and Thomas B. And what I want to say is Thomas B has decided to become a YouTube member. So I just want to say to you personally, thank you very much for deciding to become a YouTube member. You won't regret it. And the help you're going to give to the channel is going to go a long way to, like I say, keep this going. If I didn't have any of you doing this, I wouldn't be doing a YouTube channel. So thank you so much for deciding to do that. And thank you to all my necromancers and everyone else as well who, because of you guys, I, like I say, I'm able to keep this up and I really don't know what to say apart from give you a shout out and a thank you in every one of my videos. So thank you so much for the keen support there. If you would like to become one of these amazing people, like I say, click the join or the link to my Patreon down below. But if you can't do any of that, guys, no worries at all. But what I do ask if you did enjoy the video, please, like I say, smash the like, subscribe and bell notification. And if you think you know someone who will find this video useful as well, make sure we share it with them. Happy to, you know, obviously share as much of my content you'd like to. And if you've got any more questions, you would like to join a Discord. I have actually got a Discord here at Agent Agash where you can click the link to it in the description down below. It takes you to my Discord. And in there, there's always people chatting about Warhammer. We've got so many people who join who are new to Warhammer Age of Sigma that we're all used to be able to answer your questions and try and help you play Age of Sigma and even maybe give you a game on TTS, on Tabletop Simulator, to try and help you figure things out before you actually have your first game in person um, when obviously restrictions are lifted and we're out of lockdown and everything else. But um, beyond all that, guys, the main thing is I'm glad that you came and watched this video today. I hope I managed to help you out. I hope you've learned something from this video because that, that's the goal of this video and I hope that I achieve that. But remember until next time that I hope you stay safe, stay hygienic, wear a mask, and for God's sake, wash your hands. So that means by the time you can actually play your games, you know what's going on, and hopefully things will be better in the world to be able to play those games. But more importantly than that, is remember until next time, that Nagash is all, and all is one in Nagash.